Hello everyone, welcome to uh, episode 13, season 2 of Photography Chat. Uh, we're going to be joined by uh, Andre Dominguez here shortly. Um, let's see if we can get him on here. Um, I hope you all have been having a great week and, um, you know, looking forward. Oh, there we go. We got Andre in the mix there. Wait for him to join. Hey, Merlin, how's it going, man? I was just living the dream, man. How are you? <laughs> Doing good. Just clocked out here at work. Oh, nice. You're still in the office. Cool chat. You're, you're still at the office? Yeah. Right. Figured that it's probably better to stay here than try to make it home and get stuck in LA traffic and be late. How's, how's the traffic been and everything with like COVID and stuff? It was actually really good for a long time, but now that, you know, the, the, I think the number of people kind of back at work and vaccinated and everything is starting to increase here in Southern California, it's definitely been getting worse. I've been, you know, cursing on the highway a lot more frequently now. <laughs> yeah, you guys are all of a sudden doing way better than, uh, than we are doing now. Like it was, there was definitely like a, a, a difference in like how you guys managed the first part of the pandemic versus now and you know it seems to maybe be coinciding with the change of management <laughs> you know uh, i'm just happy that we're moving in the right direction i've gotten my first vaccine a good chunk of the office has also gotten there first so you know soon we should be able to have the the old school Cinestill uh, backyard barbecues and photo walks and things like that. Really looking forward to uh, you know more more safe social activities. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I'm definitely jealous of like you know seeing all my American friends getting their vaccinations, and uh, I'm sitting here in Canada being like, so guys, <laughs> what's what's up? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, today was actually a really good mail day in terms of um, of kind of getting new stuff in. I got two two cameras in, so I'm 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 a very happy camper today. <laughs> what did what did you get? Uh, one was uh, from my good buddy Junior Wyatt, lovely Mamiya RB67. Beautiful. And uh, getting in for review from my buddy Steve over in the UK a uh, Chroma snapshot. Four by five. Whoa! What is what is that beast? Uh, so this is a kind of point and shoot style, um, you know, four by five camera. It's got here a little kind of protective cover for the ground glass, but you can obviously use it with the ground glass on a tripod with a dark cloth. But you know, the way that that I want to be using it is more as a as a point and shoot, with a little three D printed. Uh, mm -hmm kind of sports finder. It's got a, a metal helicoid on there. So you can use that in conjunction with the uh, ground glass to kind of pre-calibrate it. Um, and so with my little laser range finder this weekend, I'll be calibrating the helicoid with a few different lenses because um, you can also change the focal length by changing out these metal spacer bars. Uh, so I've got a 90, a little 96.8 pancake, a 135 4.7, you know, small little press uh, pancake style lens, and then a larger Schneider 210 uh, 5.6. So I'll be, you know, testing out all of those lenses and, and making some markings on the metal helicoid uh, so that as I'm kind of walking around, I can just be using the viewfinder, sort of frame up my shot, uh, lays in my, my distance, and then just dial it in on the helicoid. Uh, with a graphmatic six sheet uh, holder in the back. So very, very excited to test that out. Uh, my buddy Alan is going to be helping me make a little video review of this for the podcast. Nice. And um, yeah, just cool, cool stuff all around. So you, you brought four by five up early and I know Stephanie was going to pounce on you with this one, but since you already brought up <laughs> four by five, I, I'm going to, I'm going to do it on, on the voice. Sounds good. And, uh, when can we get some four by five double X or 800? 
or uh you know uh there are things in the works is all i will say it's something that we get asked pretty frequently um all film starts off as a master role and so there's definitely the capability there but in terms of timing in terms of uh you know figuring out how much to make what the demand would be like we're we're working on it but it'll definitely be very very exciting when we do people went nuts over the 800T and 50D 4x5 that we made um back if i don't even know what year it was uh when we did the Indiegogo campaign to try to kind of raise some money for bringing 50D and 800T into 120. So a very, very small number of people out there have gotten a chance to shoot large format Cine still. Uh, I can already see here the comments of Stephanie's excited. Yo, we're, 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 the, 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 I like that. I demand all of it. <laughs> I love you, Stephanie. Hey, Brandy, how's it going? Uh, Brandy, it's shout out to, to Brandy. You guys got to bring the podcast back. I'm I'm missing it very much. Yeah, I, I think that depends on her cohort, though, because I think she's in in the chocolate business now and not so much mm -hmm. the, the photo business. But you know, shout out to Brandy, one of my favorite people, a fellow Pola person. Yeah, I, I miss the Polacons. It's, yeah, it's gonna be another year of like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh... Yeah, and some of you, I will shoot some four by five cine still. I think so many people would shoot four by five. Yeah, because that that's the. It's, it's really you know, especially the hundred T would would fill such a great you know void. There there is no uh, tungsten balance option for for four by five. No. So, hey, yeah. the future is a bright and shiny place uh, for film, and it's something that I would love to see. Fingers crossed, it uh, will happen sooner rather than later what but I, what i'd really love to see is you guys making some 800 t 8 by 5 or sorry 8 by 10 so that um i could watch jason shit his pant when he like <laughs> <afraid of that. laughs> his <YouTube channel. laughs> yeah, it's like, so uh merlin how, how does this uh how does this work i would love to say that i have watched more of these than i have but i think i've watched one and it seemed pretty kind of uh chill you know, not not too much of a huge format or introduction or anything like that, but so, you're you're in charge, so let me know how this works. So honestly, it's it's very organic. Um, this all came about last year uh, because I was just fucking around with Instagram Live, and uh, Jason Moore and I were talking about photography stuff on like this thing that I used to I call it cooking with Merlin where whenever I made dinner which is kind of rare because I'm lazy and eat out a lot uh, I would just like turn my camera on and people started asking a lot of photo questions and then someone's like you should just make this a show and right. uh, so Jason helped me kick off the first show last year and we did 20 episodes last year which kind of blew my mind and then I've just been keeping it up this year like one every Thursday and the idea is um there's no idea like it's really just um, you know spending an hour or so with uh, with another photographer um kind of just shooting the shit organically if questions come up in the chat uh we talk about that but it's, it's really just kind of like uh, a time to uh get to know another person um you know share the love of photography, uh, share some, some information, um, and, um, you know, forget that we're living in a pandemic for a little bit. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, hey man, that's, that's, that's awesome. I really look forward to it. Uh, you and I met at the film photography by Dea in, what was that? 2019, 2018? That was, uh, yeah, 2019. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was the last one. And yeah, both mm -hmm. uh, uh, Brandy and Stephanie have been, uh, you know, guests on the show, and it was just fantastic mm -hmm. to chat with both of them. Um, and these do get saved afterwards, right? Yeah, so I put them <laughs> on my IGTV, and then I also um, put them on YouTube so that I can sh share them on my website. And then I started um, putting everything on podcast format as well, too, audio only. So nice. it's on Apple podcast and, um, you know, Amazon and Spotify and all the podcasting platforms. Um, 
I found this like hosting site called Red Circle. And um, it's been pretty cool because like it's free and um, it just automatically distributes everything to all the places. So all I have to do is upload it to them and they make it easy. So I put the whole back catalog of episodes in and I do my best to make sure that I upload the, the latest one early, but um, you know, <laughs> I, I'm lazy sometimes. Hey, I get it. I mean, there's a reason why Mike does basically everything for our podcast is that I'm not good at it. And the times that we have, you know, shifted the responsibility onto my shoulders, it has not gone well. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's the thing. Like, if I was just doing this as a, as a regular podcast, I don't think I would keep up with it because, like, mm -hmm. it's just so easy with the Instagram live thing because I just turn it on and then it's there and then yeah i just use a, a website to steal my video from instagram <laughs> and download it and then i upload that onto youtube and then i rip the youtube one onto an mp3 and then upload that onto so it's like and i mean like who needs editing right just leave everything in <laughs> exactly i am super lazy and just Making, making my mental notes not to spill any sinister secrets, especially because I'm pretty sure that my, my bosses are in the next room and can hear me. Well, I mean, so uh, Brian is going to be on an episode next month. So nice. we'll nail him for secrets on that episode. <laughs> <laughs> You're off the hook on this one. <laughs> so you're all good there. And Paul, yes, yes it is on... Um, on the Apple podcast is just photography chat with Merlin on, on all of the uh, platforms. Um, but there's an interesting question here. Thoughts on clubhouse. So mm. I know you've been playing with clubhouse a little bit, right? Yeah. For a little while. Uh, I, I definitely have gone through my like cycles of uh, activity on there at the beginning. I was very much like, you know, ah, oh, there's you know, new social media platform. I already suck enough at Instagram. <laughs> I, I didn't see it as something that, that I would actually enjoy. And then like a week later after being on there was addicted to it. I was on every single night uh, during my, my lunch breaks while I was driving. Uh, and now I'm kind of at a once in a while, I'll pop in. If somebody pings me, I'll, I'll you know, jump in, answer some questions about Sinistil stuff or, or just hang out for a little bit, but I really like it. I think it's an interesting, different way to have these sorts of conversations. As cool as it has been to have more of some of these, you know, one-on-one -on -one with the chat, of course, not, not uh, you know, ghosting you guys in there, uh, through, through Instagram, having that ability to not have, to have A, more people on there at a time, which there's a there's a happy number of, of kind of how many people in a clubhouse room where it's actually nice beyond that it kind of tends to get too hectic uh but also the the freedom to be able to just be muted have my phone in my pocket with earphones in while i'm uh you know doing the dishes or laundry like i see here that like you know jesse and victor who just uh joined in i met them through clubhouse and i consider them friends now we've exchanged a lot of interesting conversations and ideas uh, i've been able to provide you know tips and things and it's also just fun to to hang out with with people the the podcast is a lot of fun to record but it is limited to just the uh, the, the hosts and uh, a guest, or sometimes when we do every once in a while, these kind of round table episodes, uh, we may have three or four previous guests that we've had in the past, but having this sort of audio only, almost kind of like a beers and cameras type uh, hangout that's via audio. And you can technically share images by doing the whole like, PTR pull to refresh thing where you change your profile picture and if you tap on it like you can see it a tiny bit bigger yeah. is kind of hilarious uh, because <laughs> it, it's people making the most of, of what the limitations of the platform are uh, and there have been some rooms that I've kind of consistently been in uh, Zach Heaton who actually just joined here he runs one that has a very different flavor to some of the other rooms uh, some are much more 
you know, casual and, and joking around, making inside jokes, feeling like you're kind of hanging out with your friends talking about more than just photography. Mm -hmm. And some are a little bit more focused on the photographic side of things. Uh, we've got one that is often hosted by my buddy, uh, Michael Delacroix over at uh, Camera Center of York, and he's like super gear heavy. So if I'm in a mood where, you know, I, I'm in a clubhouse room and they're talking very deeply about art, and I'm like, that's awesome, but my head's just in a different space right now. I want to nerd out about gear. I'll join Michael's clubhouse room and just nerd out for two hours. So there's a lot there, and I'm excited for the platform to. Uh, spread out to Android and, and have people kind of start using it in different ways because I think that there's a lot of potential there for really any uh, hobby that has a, a sense of community in there because I've already seen like the, the watch enthusiast community which I'm also very involved in uh, yeah. embracing it as well so it's 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 definitely cool to see it grow. Yeah, it's that's been my experience with it too. Is like it's it's been an interesting platform, um, and there is really it, it depends on the rooms you go into because you go into some of those rooms um, where it's just it's too many people, mm -hmm. um, not only in in like the speaker section but just like you know, listening. So it's just like it's yeah. hard to interact. Like if you want to like you know raise your hand up and like you know ask questions like. Is nicer when it's a smaller group, so that you can have a little bit more interaction there. And, and like, not to hate on digital, uh, you know, Manny here, Film Life and Digital just joined. Uh, not to hate on digital, but like the 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 did the non strictly film photography rooms that I've been in, I've just like I, I like gear, but I just have not been able to get into them. It, it's something about most film photographers. I won't say all that I really just tend to click with them so well. Yeah, I, I haven't really liked a lot of the digital rooms either because it's just like, I, just, I don't relate to a lot of that. Um, I fucking hate editing so much. <laughs> yeah. Like if you want it to look like film, just shoot film. <laughs> <laughs> it's way easier. You'll save yourself a lot of head. <laughs> Um, and then you'll have to edit less because you'll have like 36 photos instead of like 500. Um, mm -hmm. I also like, I haven't liked some of the rooms you go into where there's like these people giving advice and people are just lapping it up because like they have like a few thousand followers or 10,000 followers. So like, oh my God, this person's an expert. And it's just like terrible advice you're just you're hearing it and you're like no 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 yeah. don't listen to this person and people are like i'm not I'm I'm this is so good like it's I, i've noticed there's some rooms you go in where it's just like these people didn't get enough hugs as a child and, and now they've found this is way to like, get that love uh, uh, yeah life. but there's also been some like fantastic rooms mm -hmm. um you know i i love Michael's room like you know that, that's yeah. a great one and I've been talking to him about trying to get him on the show as well photo man Bob has like some great ones as well too um I've met some really fantastic people through that so it's like Clubhouse is an interesting platform and I'm curious to see where it'll go um the the one thing that I kind of like don't like though is like I've seen so many rooms there where they're like Instagram's dead or like you know it, it comes up as a topic of conversation in almost any room you drop into related to yeah. photography where a bunch of people start shitting on um, you know Instagram and I disagree completely that Instagram is dead it just depends how you're using it and how you're interacting with it yeah and that's a very very good point because like you know, you can you can make the algorithm do a bunch of things. I don't follow, you know, anybody that's not uh, a friend of mine in the film photography industry or a friend of mine in like the watch enthusiast community. So I don't find like I don't see things in my feed that I don't want to see other than some, you know, sponsored ads and things like that. But yeah. like like Brandy's saying here, you have the ability to curate your your feed uh 
with with our podcast like a, a lot of the community building is done through our facebook group which like yeah yuck facebook right um <laughs> to, to pair it that same kind of negative attitude that a lot of people would just dump on a certain social media platform and there's been friends of mine in the film photography community that i've tried to kind of bring into it to say like hey don't you don't have to use your real name don't add your family don't add your friends from high school like if you don't want to have all that like politics talk and, and fake news stuff create a, an account join our group if you want to uh, and you can have it so that there's nothing on there but film photography stuff and that's exactly what I do uh, Probably a lot of my friends from high school and college don't really like it, but I've friended a lot of people. And pretty much just who's on there are my film photography friends. And, you know, there's there's value to sometimes not keeping yourself in an echo chamber. But if it's outside of my work hours when I just want to have fun and, you know, share my work, uh, see the work of, of my friends in the community who are doing awesome stuff and just really want that sense of community – I will absolutely create the most awesome, you know, targeted uh, echo chamber possible. Well, so and like, that's what Instagram my Facebook is like. and my Instagram are like such fun places for me to be uh, to the point where sometimes I have to make sure that I'm not spending too much time there, but not for like a bad reason because it makes me feel bad. Like I hear a lot from friends outside of, uh, of these communities that like, Oh, if I, if I spend, you know, more than 30 minutes on Instagram, I just get depressed. I'm like, no, I just, I just get motivation to shoot. I I'm reminded of people here in the city that I haven't seen in a while that I want to go on a photo walk with, or eventually when we can grab a beer with, like I try to make my experience on social media as, as fun, engaging and inspiring as possible. Yeah. Well, and, and that's what you have to do. Like, I mean, my my Facebook is still um, sort of a toxic dung heap because, like, you know, I've got family and, like, high school peeps on there and, like, a, a smattering of other stuff. Um, so, like, that one's been a little tougher to curate. But my Instagram has um, just absolutely been curated to be, like, that positive echo chamber of sorts where it's just, like, you know, when I started using it specifically for photography in 2017, it's just really evolved to be like completely all about photography and the photography communities that I, I've become part of. And um, it's how I like, you know, stay in contact with everyone and connect with new people. And, you know, even through the chats, like, you know, um, none of this would have happened had it not been for Instagram. So it's yeah. become like, a, a, for me, a great force of good. And um, sometimes the, the chats feel like a, a bunch of, of work and I want to be like I'm tired <laughs> I, I don't want to do this anymore but then I get like a message from somebody that's just like hey I, I want to thank you because like these chats have really been helping me get through these like weird times or it's like it, mm -hmm. it's nice because they, they're like it feels like I'm connecting to people and I'm like you know learning new things and so I'm like okay I can't give up because like it's a, become an important thing and it's, it's bigger than me um, and it's also just like fun to like do the chat and actually chat to people it's just all the like back end stuff like you know remembering to like do the stories to promote it and then like doing the uploads and stuff it's just like i kind of hate that shit but i love <laughs> doing the chat so. just, but i mean that's been a normal theme for me like even in my daily work um i hate all the administrative shit i like doing the work but like all the other shit that like circles work I hate that so much. I mean, I think I think I can speak for most people that shooting is awesome. You know, I personally find developing really cool, but like scanning, file management and organization. There's definitely some people that love it, but I am not one of those people. Yeah, I I hate scanning. <laughs> that's that's kind of why I've stopped doing my own development at home is mm -hmm. because I just hate doing the scanning part of it um i might have because i'm moving to vancouver at the end of this month um so i might have to move, right because you're based in toronto right yeah i'm in toronto right now but i'm originally from the west coast and mm -hmm. all my family's out there and um you know it's been over a year and a half since i've seen my family and um i miss them like you know i uh 
I want to see my nieces and nephews. And, uh, you know, it's just, if I stay in Toronto and wait for um, COVID to like run its course, like it could be like two and a half or three years before I finally yeah. see them. So I kind of, uh, you know, put it to work. I was like, hey, what does it matter if I'm in an apartment in Toronto or if I'm in an apartment in Vancouver? Like I'm doing everything on the internet. So let me move. And they finally approved it. So um, I'm going to be headed to Vancouver at the end of this month. And uh, I'm a little bit sad about it because like downtown camera here in Toronto has really spoiled yeah. it out of me because like they're on it. Oh. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, and, and John, you'll have to remind me here in the, in the chat, uh, Caresdale cameras. I don't know exactly if that's in Vancouver or near Vancouver, yeah, but right. I know that Vancouver on um, Broadway. Perfect. Well, you go, you go pay John uh, a, a visit. He's here in the chat. Uh, JR Foot Photography BC. Uh, you know, good, good friend, you know, really great professional. His shop is great. From what I hear, I've never had the pleasure of visiting in person. Um, but yeah, there I, you go. I've not been Caresdale to cameras. Caresdale cameras yet because I've been like fairly loyal to Bo Photo. I, but, you hey, know. you don't you don't have to be monogamous when it comes to your camera shops. <laughs> Every little bit helps the industry. It's okay. <laughs> That's fair. So I will. Um, <clears throat> Coquit oh, okay, Coquitlam. Um, mm -hmm. Coquitlam's nice. Maybe I'll, I'll give you a follow there, uh, or follow me, and then I'll follow you back, Jr. And I'll come visit when when I get settled there. Um, what I'm bummed about those labs, because like. I've seen some of the labs there, like the, the stuff that friends get back from them. And I haven't been like super stoked about it. And like downtown cameras really spoiled me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I got to figure out what to do with that. Um, Nicole is the best at bow photo, like shout out to Nicole. Like she always gets really cool film in and um, you know, she's a wealth of knowledge and um, also just they have the coolest use section there as well because um uh you just kind of walk in and they have all these shelves of just like just random parts and camera stuff and like all these things and their prices are not obnoxious it, it's mm -hmm. just really cool um yeah and then someone here made a comment about like you know not shedding uh digital or something like that i haven't been able to completely get out of digital in my life i mean i don't think that's necessarily like the right answer either because it's all tools and I, i've mentioned this before in, in other uh places but it's just like film has a place and digital has its uh, place and like you know in, in my own practice i'm predominantly um film but i do use my digital camera for some specific things <clears throat> mostly light testing like when i'm doing like studio lighting and stuff like that i'll i'll use the digital to test that before i start firing on like polaroid or or film yeah. to make sure that i don't fuck it up or if it's like a project for like a friend or something and i don't want to like waste money on film i'll do it on <laughs> digital <laughs> Yeah, it, it's something that like i don't i don't personally own a digital camera anymore and i haven't in the better part of like four years, but you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by people who have digital cameras and, and great uh, rental houses here. So if there's ever anything that I need a digital camera for, in, including, you know, scanning now that I'm starting to dip my toes into that whole uh, digital camera scanning uh, workflow, I have options, but w with the amount of money that, you know, one of, one of these things, uh, goes for it's like that can buy a lot of film and paper and cameras and lenses and things like that so digital's great uh I'm, I'm, ha I'm having to kind of put my my head more in there now especially with helping people with digital camera scanning uh my, my sister's now getting into digital photography with like some product photography stuff uh but you know it's there it's a tool uh, i just i i don't personally want to invest my money that could be going to film or paper and things like that into a, a digital camera body at the moment. That, that's fair. Like I, I kind of lucked out cause like I'm mostly Nikon shooter. 
Um, so I just found like a decent full frame cheap body um, that I can just use all of the glass that I already have for my film cameras. Um, so depending on like what system you're on, like that that could be a way. Like if you're mostly film and you want to do digital, like you could check out like you know Nikon bodies or like you know depending on what type of Canon lenses you have. Um, or like you know I've heard great things about the Sony being used with manual lenses and things like that. Like you know, it, it's yeah, that. that that's something that I'm starting to kind of look at. So we have here at the office uh, a Fuji X Pro three and a Sony A seven whatever the hell it is. Uh, and I've I've thought about you know oh maybe it would be fun to kind of adapt. Uh, lenses on there but then i start thinking about actually going out and shooting and i don't necessarily see myself wanting to go do that and getting digital files yeah especially now that like i'm, I'm inching closer towards color ra4 uh darkroom printing you know if i'm going out what little time i have to uh to, to, to take photos and things like that. If I'm spending my time in order to create images, I want to make sure that in whatever process, be it you know traditional black and white, uh, color negative, slide, I really wanna do uh, black and white positive soon. I wanna make sure that I can put that into either a darkroom print or project it and you know, I, I, I don't care very much of, about seeing something only on a screen yeah. or uh, sending it off to get digitally printed. So that's just kind of where, where I'm at right now. Brandy had a question for you here. Um, she was wondering, what's your ideal shooting situation? Weather, location, camera, film, and why? That's a tough one. I don't necessarily have, like, some people have, like, their thing, you know, like, oh, my thing is a, a, a rainy, overcast day with a large format camera out in the woods doing nature. Uh, with with the way that I kind of a, approach my photography, uh, a lot of it is based on either the people that I'm with or where I happen to find myself. And I do a lot of photography when I travel, which because of COVID, I haven't been able to do in a long time. Uh, but, you know, just kind of travel documentary stuff, walking around a city with a, a rangefinder and some, some black and white film is something that I always love. Uh, alternatively, you know, little family trips, even if it's just, hey, we're going to go on a picnic in the park. I love uh, having a, you know, autofocus matrix metering uh slr like a like an f100 with some uh of the new kodak ektachrome e100 slide film because that's a thing that obviously i can scan the slide film but when i'm with family and i'm you know visiting uh family i want to pull out the Kodak carousel slide projector and make my family sit through <laughs> a, a slideshow um, and, and that really, because of the expense of the film, because of the expense of the processing, uh, I, I take my time. I'm, granted, I'm using a camera that's going to make the metering a little bit easier for me so that, you know, if there's a little bit of alcohol involved sometimes, I don't have to be <laughs> as worried about making sure that things are in focus, making sure that my metering is all right. The camera is going to do that for me. That's fine. I can just focus on composition and getting, you know, the, the, the really special moments. But having, let's say, an old fashioned in, in one hand and an F100 with 35 uh, F2 um, lens, autofocus lens, allows me to capture, let's say, a backyard barbecue or uh, spending time with, with family one handed and get a, an, an actual final product being a color slide that I can scan and send to them so that they can you know, share it around amongst the extended family in our WhatsApp group. But when we're together again, even if that's only in the next six months, in the next year, I've got that already curated, you know, slideshow already all mounted that I can just drop into the carousel and uh, project. Like, that, that means the world to me. And I'm actually think very much so thinking of 
picking up a, a zoom lens, which is always something that I've never particularly been interested in uh, specifically for that scenario of shooting slide film uh, with friends and family so that I can have a little bit more dynamic of a look throughout the whole thing, get my wide establishing shots, have most of my stuff be in like the 35 to 50 range and a few, you know, longer, tighter uh, detail shots for, you know, if you're looking for a zoom for the Nikon body, <clears throat> the one zoom light, I love it to death um, is the 28 to 105, 3.5 to 4.5 D. See, that's already too, that's already, you know, I'm think I, I've been doing some research and I looked into that. Uh, that's already, I think, you know, more than, than what I need. The one that I'm looking at is the 24 to 50. Okay. I think it's like F3.5 to 4. Point something. Uh, and, and that I think would be that and maybe like a, a fast 50, like a 51.8, you know, the teeny tiny ones, uh, I think would be a great combo because if I'm shooting really, you know, wide at the 24 in, I don't need a, a wide aperture. Yeah. Uh, if, I, if I do want to have a shot with shallow depth of field, I just swap that out for the little nifty 50. But most of the things are going to be stopped down. So That's I don't mind that it's a slower lens. And it's a really, you know, useful set of focal lengths so yeah that's just a, a purchase that i've been kind of playing around with in my head i've been trying to see if i can find something on keh the, the one thing that i like about the 28 to 105 though is it's got this like badass macro mode on it um that you can turn on and still use some of the the zoom with the macro um, so I use that a lot when I'm doing street photography, if I'm trying to get like graffiti or like art that's like up further away than I could reach it with like a 50. Cause like what I usually shoot with my F5, um, my everyday lens is a 51.4. I love the shit out of that lens. Like it's such a nice lens. Um, but I have a 51.8 that I usually have on the F100. So that if I want to shoot color in uh, black and white the same day, I'll usually have color in the F5 and black and white in the F100. Um, I think you had both in your in your bag, right? One at the Paideia, because I was like, not I mean, the F100 is not the hugest thing, uh, but like I was like, all right, you know, dual dual wielding autofocus Nikon bodies. I I I, I think I. I, I saw that before I talked to you, and I was like, I'm going to like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, the, the F5 is, um, it was a dream camera. I never thought I'd ever own one. Because, um, mm -hmm. like, when I started getting, I, I was late getting into film. Like, I didn't start getting heavy into the film until, like, 2017. Um, after, like, an almost 10-year hiatus of, like, photography in general. Um, and when I started getting into film, I always wanted an F80 because like my first digital uh, SLR ever was a Nikon D70 and the F80 was like the, you know, the film equivalent to that. So I picked one up because it was cheap and then an F100 came up for super cheap and I was just like, well, I always wanted an F100 and I didn't think I could afford one. So I got that and then an F5 came up like wicked cheap and uh, I was like, I really thought I would never own an F5. Um, and that, it's such a beautiful camera. Like, it's a beast. Like, it's a workout mm -hmm. using that camera. But um, I love it for street photography because it, it also doubles as a weapon. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> if someone's coming at me, I could just, like, fucking clock them with it. And, yeah. you know, they, they will regret mean, that decision. This thing here is also, you know, hopefully not, I mean, knock on wood, but very much could be used as a self-defense tool. Dude, that thing's like a howitzer. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was wild oh we got another question here too so jeffrey asks should i be a bit more concerned about expiration of cinestill 800t sorry i didn't get the okay cool you pinned it should i be a bit more concerned about the expiration of cinestill 800t even if it's stored in the fridge um in general cinestill color films are more sensitive uh to like environmental uh, factors and, and age than other, uh, you know, color films. A, because of what it, it comes from originally. Motion picture film, you know, if, if, if you ever have a chance to, to shoot some 16 millimeter or, you know, 
big 35 millimeter cans, there's no expiration date written on there. You, you can find out uh, by looking up the, the codes and everything when it was coded, but it's not meant to be sticking around for years and years and years. It gets produced, you know, uh, sold, shot, processed promptly. So you're already working with very sensitive raw material and then the, uh, the, the you know, our proprietary pre-removal process that removes the, the remjet layer also, you know, makes it so that, like, the film isn't going to last for seven years sitting in your fridge. So our, our general kind of best practice is, like, when you buy it, take a look at the expiration date, try to shoot it, you know, within that, but ideally uh, as soon as possible. And this goes for, for any film, really. I mean, gamma like background gamma radiation from like the big bang does fog your film the same way that that really strong x-ray x-rays do um shooting fresh film and processing it promptly is always a good idea the more you know <laughs> I mean, that, that's why, like, when, when you're dealing with really old film and it looks fogged, but it's been stored well, that's what that comes from, is, is you know, it's all, you know, in that electromagnetic spectrum, the same way that, like, x-rays, you can't see x-rays, but they'll fog your film. Film that's just old is, you know, being hit with stuff constantly that can go through metal, etc. I don't want to kind of, like, put too much on this, but... Just in general, like if you have some expired film, hey, you know, knock your socks off, go shoot it. But definitely if you want consistency of results and the the nice kind of warm, fuzzy feeling of knowing that every uh, roll of film that you buy is, is supporting the modern, the contemporary film photography industry, and you want to vote with your dollar, shoot fresh film, buy fresh film. Yeah, and don't give it to Fuji. <laughs> uh, your words, not mine. <laughs> not, not because you work for Sinistel, but a bunch of like horrible cunts. But that's a totally different topic. <clears throat> yeah, I, I will say though, one of my coworkers uh, just recently received his uh, Mamiya RZ67 Instax back. I can't remember the name of the company. It's like Z Zinstax or something like that. That thing is very, very cool. And I hear that they are working on one for the RB. Nice. So as much as I would like to shoot Polaroid, and I know that you're a really big Polaroid uh, fan, the consistency that you can get from the Instax Emulsion uh, paired with something like an RB, that's a very attractive thing to me. Well, it, it is. Like, I, I will give Fuji credit where credit is due. <clears throat> The Instax medium is a fantastic medium. It's just a shame that almost all the Instax cameras are epic pieces of shit. Um, it, it just does a total disservice to the film. Uh, Cause like, you know, the only Leica that I own and can afford is the Instax version of the Leica. <laughs> and that has a glass lens on it and it makes beautiful Instax mini photos. And uh yeah, I've got a Lomography Square camera, which glass lens as well, takes beautiful Instax Square photos. Um, and, you know, I've seen Instax wide done in 4x5 and, like, you know, in uh, modified gooses and things like that. And mm -hmm. super beautiful. So it's just, like, that film with a good lens is so nice. And, yeah. you know, and, like, they they make they make awesome uh, cameras in the digital realm. Yeah, because one would think that it would not be it being such a profitable uh, area for for their business that making a really good electronic whiz bang all fully featured with a glass lens that they clearly know how to make well uh, camera that shoots in stacks would be a, a no brainer. But we haven't seen it yet. Yeah, but I mean, like, I think no-brainer and common sense are things that don't apply to Fuji at all. Because <laughs> there's a lot of things that could have been <laughs> no-brainer or common sense that is just like, oh, okay, 
Uh, we've got a we've got a good question here from Manny at Film Life and Digital. What do you think about bulk rolls? Why don't Why don't you start first, Marlon? I've never fucked with them yet, so it's something that I've thought about. Um, I was talking with some guys at the gallery that I'm part of uh, of the next time they did like a bulk order of double X getting in with them on that one. Cause um, you know, they can just get double X down to like crazy cheap prices. Um, but it's not something I've done yet. Um, mostly out of fear. <laughs> Cause it's just like, I'm, I'm You're like, ruining a hundred feet of film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's the same reason why I haven't done color processing at home yet, because I just like. Oh, it's not that hard. It. <laughs> well, that's what people keep telling me, but the whole temperature thing kind of wakes me out because it's just like black and white's easy. I haven't fucked that up yet, but it just seems like there's um, a higher degree of like potential to fuck it up doing color, and uh, I just don't trust myself with that. So, you know, Merlin, there's a company that I think has really, really uh, nailed that down to a science, and maybe even sell some really cool starter kits with everything that you need. But uh, what company? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, they've got a red and white logo, but. <laughs> Oh, man, it's on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> like in uh, film? Ah, it's not like that. Anyway, um, <laughs> no, Brand Brandy has a good point here where she says that it's definitely a, a, a commitment. And absolutely, because yeah. I think some people get into to bulk film for, for different reasons. For some, it's cost-based, which, depending on the film stock that you're choosing, is going to be more or less of a cost savings. I love Triax, but try to buy 100 feet of tracks from you know someone like bnh it's not much cheaper than individual rolls whereas hp5 yeah you are gonna save some i know a lot of people love the ultra fine extreme stuff even though like we have no idea what that is and that generally kind of wigs me out i i don't like shooting something that i don't know what it is because if i if i don't know that it's actively being coated like it's an emulsion that's actively being coated or there's not very reliable developing times for it. I don't know if that company is in a good, you know, not not that most of these companies are publicly traded, but like there's a general sense for how well a company is is doing. And so like if it's something where I don't know any of that information, I don't really like to shoot it. But uh, if you've got a stock, and we're mainly talking black and white here because there's not really, I don't really think that there's any, modern uh color film that's offered in in bulk lengths uh if you're if you're talking about black and white film there's a benefit to if you if you've really nailed down like the film stock that you like doing everything on one alternative to that uh because another reason some people like bulk film is that they can load a 12 exposure roll if they want uh, one alternative to that that I've been doing for a while, because 36 exposures is quite a bit for, for me sometimes, is uh, cutting a roll in half in the darkroom. Um, or, I mean, I've done it inside a changing bag before we had access to a great darkroom with night vision goggles and everything like that. Um, but if you split down a 36 exposure roll in half in a changing bag or in a dark room, um, you can usually get around 15 exposures. Uh, and like that for me, it's, it's three more than what I get in six by six. And it's more or less what I get in six, four, five. So that's a, a, a frame count that I'm really comfortable with and that my brain likes to think in, in terms of going out and, and shooting. And you can do it with any 35 millimeter film on the market. So if I've got some, you know, Loma Chrome purple that I want to, you know, uh, cut in half, I'm only losing six shots out of 36, which like, you know, that's a fifth of the roll. It's not that bad. Um, I do that on 800T a lot. Uh, I did that last week with some Pan F50. And it's it's just something that that I think not a whole lot of people think about it it, it. it may not make sense for, for people if they're like, no, I love 36 exposures. That's never too much for me. I want to buy a half frame camera and have to shoot 72. Oh man. You I know? hate shooting oh. 72. I, I shot only one roll in the half frame camera and I hated it. It took so long. <laughs> yeah. like, it was just, it was like such a chore because I was just like, Oh my God, is this roll ever going to fucking end? <laughs> yeah, but I usually shoot 36 and I like that. Like, I feel, 
And it's only because like downtown camera charges the same amount of money to process 12 exposures or 24 exposures or 36 exposures. Yeah. So I'm just like, no, I want to get that's definitely a good money. point. Yeah. Mm. But see, Brandy, like, that's why if you want to, to have a 12 to 15 exposure roll, to be able to do that with any film, color film, slide film, uh, you know, any black and white film, you, if you have a roll of, of, of 35 millimeter film and a changing bag, you can, you can cut it down in half or even smaller. I've, I've done even smaller lengths for testing cameras and things like that. Mm -hmm. Do we have another another question? They're going by really quickly, so sometimes I miss them. Ah. Someone said color is easier than black and white. I'll definitely have to give it a shot, but I'll probably do that once I get settled in uh, in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, have you played around with four by five yet? Uh, dude, I love 4x5. I got uh, my, my main favorite camp that I like to drink with is uh, my Wista 4x5. Nice. It's uh, it's such a gorgeous camera. Um, and Jeffrey, who asked the question about the 800T, um, I sold him a super graphic that had a working range finder. So it was just like you could run and gun 4x5 with that one if you wanted to, which is kind of badass. There's like a little, <laughs> little piece of me who kind of regretted selling it because like the Wista is beautiful, but it's like uh, I got to set it up on the tripod yeah. and take my time to, to do the shot. Yeah, I've got a, a Bush Pressman Model D, uh, which very similar to the Super Graphic, except that it doesn't have a graph lock back. It's just, you know, rotating spring back. Yeah. But, you know, I've, I've shot that with a Graphmatic back. Uh, my rangefinder definitely needs recalibrating, but... Man, that would be a really, really fun uh, setup. Some some four by five eight hundred T just walking around the city. <laughs> yeah, that'd be super cool. Like I, I just recently picked up um, a bees reel for processing four by five. Because I love my four by five. I don't really shoot four by five film in it much though. Like I predominantly used it for. Uh, Polaroid sheet film that I have left like type 55 and stuff and uh, with pack film um, yeah and like my pack I, I still have like a healthy hoard but it's not going to last forever so mm -hmm. I just like I need to get the a better way to try processing four by five at home because I've tried using the mod 54 and it made me never want to shoot four by five because like, <laughs> I just kept kept getting so annoyed uh, that yeah. it would pop out and then they would just stick to the sides of the tank and I'd fuck up the shot. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. four by five is way too expensive to be fucking up and developing. <laughs> um, and like Pete, who, um, so there's a there's another cat named Pete Damascus. Um, we do a once a month show the first Friday of every month called Large Format Fridays with Pete and Merlin. Um, and he's like a wild man. He processes in the old Kodak total dark room. So like he sets up all of his stuff and then just like shuts the dark room off and just does everything in complete darkness. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm not I'm not that that cool. I can't yeah. do that. I've been using the uh, what is it the it's the Stearman Press SP four four five. It kind of looks like a big like two uh, two spout drinking flask oh, yeah, uh, it holds, yeah it holds four sheets and uses like 500 milliliters or a little bit less of uh chemistry so you know it's pretty efficient um a lot of times i'm just going out with two film holders anyway yeah. so it's actually the the perfect amount uh for a lot of the the shooting that i do um but yeah, I'm, I'm getting more and more into into 4x5, and it's just been really fun. I've got a, a buddy of mine here who's been helping me out, uh, actually a couple of friends who've been helping me out, answering some questions, helping me wrap my head around the the movements. My you know latest pickup was this uh, Chroma snapshot so cool. that, you know, in, in conjunction with a little 3D printed uh, sports finder and um, my little laser range finder, I think is going to be really, really fun. Um, I'm borrowing a friend's 6x12 roll film back as well, 
So I want to kind of play around with, with that a bit. Um, but I, I'm actually going to ask you a question, Merlin. So right. you shoot, four by, I mean, you like shooting the four by five format, but not necessarily the, the film as much, but you know, you're moving more in that direction. Uh, and obviously Polaroid and, and instant film is a very important thing to you. Absolutely. Uh, when it comes to the, you know, one of a kind type uh, end of the spectrum of instant film versus creating a negative that can be printed, you know, however many times, how do you make that, that choice when it comes to what to shoot? Because, you know, seeing this, uh, for example, this RZ67 Instax back that my coworker has is just getting my mind spinning because that's so cool, but, you know, there in the moment, granted, it's got an interchangeable back, so it's not as much of a, a huge, stressful choice, given that you can kind of just change things out. But I know that I sometimes struggle with uh, which medium to shoot on, because I know that I can print however many copies I want of something if I have a negative. But there is something really nice about that kind of one and done, either peel apart or integral film, just being able to hand that over to someone or stick it on my fridge and know that like that's the one so that's how i actually fell in love with film photography honestly was um when when i moved to toronto in 2017 and uh, i was struggling connecting with the city um i bought my first digital camera in in a long time like uh, I, I still had the lens from my original d70 but the body had died ages ago so i bought a, a d300 body and was using that and kind of just like getting more like up to speed in the photography world because I'd been like removed from it for almost a decade. And I came across an interview that Jason Lee did where he was talking about the honesty of instant film. And like the, just the, the sort of gist of what he was talking about in there just really resonated with me where it's just like the reason that he loved shooting 8x10 uh, Polaroid so much was that in, in his mind, it was like the most honest image you could ever create because like, it's just, that's the only one in that moment. Like you take that shot and that's it. There's no negative. Um, you know, so you can't reproduce that image. It's just that one, you can scan it. Sure. But it's, it's never going to be the same as like looking at that image or like, if you have like an eight by 10 negative, you can reproduce the same uh, image from that. Once you have your settings dialed in, in the dark room. And uh, I was just like, I really like the idea of that, like, sort of honest, genuine image, where it's just like, even if you took two photos of the same subject back to back, they're not going to be identical, because like, maybe they have a different facial expression, or maybe they're like looking to the left instead of the right. And so it's just like, you know, it's, it's the most honest snapshot of that moment. And <clears throat> I also don't consider myself a photographer. And it took me a while to understand that. Um, whereas like I, I'm more of an archivist and photography is my tool to like archive the world around me and like the moments that I experience and um, instant photography, it just seemed like a really great medium to share those moments with people. Um, and I watched that video and I was like, oh my God, I wanna shoot eight by 10 Polaroid. And then I went on the internet and I was like, holy shit. This is why Jason Lee shoots 8x10 Polaroid, because he can afford it. <laughs> and I yeah. cannot afford it. So that's when I got into I'm like, well, what Polaroid can I afford? And um, unfortunately, I got really into Spectra, just as Polaroid Originals was killing it. Um, and then fell deep into the rabbit hole of the 600 cameras and the SX-70 cameras. And like, I think I have like... 10 8 or 10 sx70 cameras now a little bit of a problem but what i like and why i like shooting the instant film in the 4x5 is um i mostly do portraits of people with it and i give them the image that I, I don't i don't keep it um mostly because it's just like it's nice to share that moment with them I like selfishly the, the joy that I get from like seeing them get all excited from like having this image. And um, it's why I also started shooting it. Cause I've been like hoarding this film for like years now. 
And so I started doing this like portraits of people thing where I give away portraits mm -hmm. at Polacon 2019. And um, yeah, just uh, whenever I get a chance, like I, I just give people an instant portrait. I keep the FP100C negative because I keep saying one day I'm going to maybe scan them, but like, you know, I haven't yet. I have like <laughs> years of like negatives to bleach that maybe one day I'll get around to, but it's just, it's cool to like, when you peel the two pieces apart and you just see how excited people get, or even when I'm just like walking around doing street photography and someone notices like the Polaroid, um, giving them a portrait, it is kind of a cool thing. Like I ran into a lady in Calgary um, last year when I was helping my best friend move um, to Vancouver from Toronto and I was ordering some food from this takeout place and just while I was waiting, just taking some pictures and this lady was like, Hey, is that an old Polaroid? I haven't seen one of those in like ages. And uh, I was like, yeah. And she's like, I didn't even know you could get film for that. And so I like talked to her a little bit about that. And I was like, Hey, do you want a photo? And she's like, no, no. Like I, I don't. I'm like, no, it would just be for you. Like, you know, I'm not going to keep it. Like I'll take it and just give it to you. And she's like, really? Like you would just give me a photo and I'm like, yeah, well, I don't really want to have like a photo of a stranger. Like, what am I going to be like? <laughs> this is the takeout lady. And like, I love that. Yeah. They gave it. So she was just like, all of a sudden she went for me, but standoffish to like, you want to take a picture of me? And she got all excited. She's like, okay. And so it's like, you know, <laughs> touching her hair up and she's like, Do you mask on or mask off. And I'm like, we're outside and I'm far away from you. So it's like, how do you want it? Like, this is your moment to remember this and she's like mask off and so like I took the picture for her and yeah after I gave it to her she's just like you would not believe the day that I've had this is just like such a nice way to cap it off because she's like it's been kind of like a rough day and like she was all excited about that just you know I don't even know what her name is I just like I gave her this photo and you know got all stoked about it and that's one of the big reasons why I like instant photography is just there's like this, there's a magic to it still. And the, the tangibility of being wow. able to hand someone something. Cause it's just like, you know, I have 30,000 photos in my iPhone that are basically useless. Cause they just, they live inside of here and uh, they don't go anywhere else. Um, so yeah. That was a long rambly thing about why I like instant film. No, dude, that was that was beautiful. I mean, uh, I am, you know, super excited to start incorporating more instant photos into my life, and I, I really do think that that whole concept of, you know, these instant film backs for cameras that already exist is a really clever way of doing that because I could be walking around with something like completely different on my mind, not even necessarily intending to shoot people. I could be downtown doing some like architecture stuff, but you know, bump into somebody, uh, especially with how like old these cameras look like they, they don't look like anything else. So I think it's an experience that a lot of us have had many, many times of somebody asking like, is that an old camera? You know, do they still make film for that, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you can have like amazingly like poignant conversations with people. And not that I, I uh, not that I don't and wouldn't, you know, ask to take a picture on, on film and, and when I do that I usually do ask to see if they're comfortable giving me any kind of information whether it's them giving me something or me giving them my information uh, so that I can send them a, a print but it is a little bit disconnected in terms of that that um, kind of waiting period which in some cases can be really good and in some cases not uh, but having the ability if I'm out shooting some black and white film through the RB67 to just be like, actually, like, you know, can I take a, a, a picture of you? You know, I'm not going <laughs> to nitpick and be like, oh, well, this isn't technically a Polaroid. This is a Fuji Instax, blah, blah, blah. I'd be like, you know, do you mind if I take a Polaroid and, and, and give it to you? Uh, to be able to just swap that back out, you know, take the photo with uh, you know, similar settings and hand it over to them. Like, man, that's something so cool. And 
I've got a long, long uh, list of film photography related things that I want. I've got a whole spreadsheet, but uh, that that Instax back is is definitely making its way uh, higher up in that in that spreadsheet for sure. Well, I mean, like you know, as as much shade I, that I throw at Fuji, and like regardless of how much I hate them, I still buy their shit because like it's okay. I'm just salty at them because they killed pack film. <laughs> like that saltiness will never, ever subside. Uh, what I usually say is like, you know, you want a new portrait. And um, when I'm not doing, I don't do this with pack film because it's just too precious, but with uh, Polaroid and Instax, um, what I'll usually do is take two photos. Um, mm-hmm. And I'll be like, you know, I'm, I'm going to take two photos. You get to pick which one you want to keep. And then I get to keep the other one. Um, if I feel inclined to like have a record of that moment, um, oftentimes I won't. Like I'll just give them a um, uh, a photo. But if it's like a friend, like I haven't seen in a while, I'll usually like do the two photo game where it's just like you know one for you, one for me, so that we can remember this moment. Because that's one of the really th- like big things that I find magical about Polaroid that I love so much is just like you know when you pick up a Polaroid photo it's like a tangible thing you can hold and I almost find that like when I pick it up and I look at it it brings me back to the moment that I took that image and I can picture like what was going on around that moment when I took that image and um, it's something that doesn't happen when I shoot um, film or digital like it's it's a weird thing like you know it's it's almost like you know, taking that image with an instant camera, just I I capture everything around that moment and then holding that image sort of like unlocks that imprint and I can like remember details about, um, you know, what happened in that moment. Do you get any of that though with like four by six or five by seven prints? Because, you know, I I don't do as much, uh, you know, instant photography, but when I am printing like small prints as as great as eight by tens are small prints are my absolute favorite because of the fact that they're made to be either in a photo album or you know held in in your hands and i think that i get a lot of that out of small prints and i've even really wanted to start exploring um like little mini almost kind of like photo booth-esque uh contact print strips uh, i saw something where some or actually no a friend of mine uh mike kukavica had made a while ago a little sort of almost sort of you know i'm i'm saying a lot of words like uh, like a little bookmark type thing or um like a photo booth little strip of uh i think it was three or four six by six images that he took with um i don't know if it was his wife or his daughter but like I love that idea of having, you know, multiple images in a format that is small, so that you have to have it in your hands. You have to bring it up to your face, or you're actually engaging with it. Because, you know, one thing about making an eight by ten is that like you're like, cool, that's uh, that, that, that's that's really pretty right there. Yeah. So do I want to put this in a frame, or is it just gonna go in a binder somewhere? <laughs> Um, and so there's there's something really nice about uh, small prints in general, whether they be digital prints or darkroom prints or or small format instant photography. There's definitely something there about the size mattering, <laughs> to 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 put it you know bluntly. So like for for the imprinting. I think it only really like for me specifically happens with with instant photos because of the tangibility behind it. Um, Because like when I take that image and it comes out of the camera and I look at it and I'm holding it in that moment where where I shot it, um, it it just it kind of steeps in my brain when when I'm looking at that. And so it's just like, you know, I I see the photo and I remember the image. I see what's around me. Um, and I don't get that so much when I do like a digital print of like my, my film photos or a darkroom print. <clears throat> now, when I do a darkroom print, when I hold that darkroom print, I remember the darkroom 
and you know what I was listening to in the dark room at that time like what the dark room smelled like you know you know making the image so it's like it for for me it's more of like a time portal to like the moment when that was created yeah. um, and I don't really feel that with digital prints because I, I wasn't there for their creation so it's just like you know I ordered it online and then I picked it up later on and so there's no imprint of that that moment for me but it's just like you know with the darkroom printing like as you're you're swishing it in in the pan there and you just see the image pop up like you know when I hold the print I remember that moment and how cool it is and like you know I, I like playing in the darkroom for that kind of stuff because I've been playing with some like weird papers um well yeah I haven't done it in like a year because COVID but right before COVID you know I was experimenting in the darkroom with this old agfa paper that um I'm assuming got fogged or something because it, it comes up like really gray in the background. Um, but I, oh, sorry, JR Photography asked uh, what my favorite craft brew is in BC. And I'm going to disappoint you. I don't like any of the craft brew, but I love the shit out of Pacific Pilsner. It is like a super <laughs> cheap, shitty beer. It's like nine bucks, eight or nine bucks for a six pack. Um, it's delicious when it's cold. It's awful when it gets warm. And I have so many great memories around Pacific Pilsner. It's brewed in Prince George, British Columbia <laughs> with like trash toxic water downstream from a fucking pulp mill. And like, it's one of my all time favorite beers. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> uh, it's not, it's not hopsy at all. It's like, you know, it has like, you know, a, a tang of like, you know, you're in danger. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you jr i appreciate you popping in there yeah th those are the best beers oh and then uh fig stop had a question for you um i have my cinestill slide developing kit but i've never used it because i'm scared how do you recommend i get over uh get over it the fear of ruining pretty things um by just getting over it. No, uh, I, I think that there's 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 definitely a lot of fear when when people are are thinking about processing slide film. Uh, it, it is more you know temperature sensitive than color negative. You can really screw up color negative, uh, and you may not even notice because you're scanning it anyway, and you have the ability to to color correct. Uh, but you know the the most important thing is is temperature control and, and just having like a, a TCS 1000 or a sous vide um, that's 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 part of the puzzle but I've I've put together some some resources some like temperature control best practices that I think uh, are I mean not I think already have been helping a lot of people so if you have any questions about that I'd be more than happy to you know connect with anybody and, and, you know, kind of walk you through my process and, and what I recommend. But, you know, part of it is also making mistakes and learning from them. Slide film is going to be more expensive mistakes, but uh, there's definitely some things that you can do to, you know, make it more successful and, uh, you know, reach out to, to folks who are, are willing to, to help. <laughs> the comment section is is just popping off right now. <laughs> Victor, I will I will be your film daddy if you if you need some assistance. <laughs> so I'm going to create like a seeking arrangement, but for like film enthusiasts. <laughs> uh, I actually was part. I mean, I didn't do a very good job because I was way too busy with the work. Because back then I was the only one doing customer service as Cinestill for the whole world. Now we actually have a, a team to do that, which is great. A lot more weight off of my shoulders. But uh, Emulsive on his uh, film photography chat Facebook group had this like mentor program thing where you would, you know, note if you were uh, a beginner, you know, experienced or like a master at, at like something at some specific topic. And then you would get paired up with somebody that could ask you tons of questions. It, I don't think that it ended up, you know, really working out. At least it very much didn't so on, on my end, and I apologize profusely to the person that I was paired up with. But I don't know, maybe there's maybe there is a way to kind of revive that somehow and, and, and put it in a platform that is 
more accessible to more people? Because I definitely think that um, there's a lot of knowledge that can be shared. Unfortunately, I've seen so much misinformation when it comes to, you know, education within film photography. And uh, we're, we're bringing on some, uh, some people at Cinestill to help us with, uh, you know, more video content and educational content. Uh, not necessarily saying that our word is gospel and that we're not capable of making mistakes or that there's a only one right way to do things, but there are some best practices that I think that we've we've been able to really nail down over the years and I've really been focusing on with regards to customer service that I, I look forward to having more avenues for spreading some of that knowledge. Clubhouse has been a great um, example of that. I've I've hosted a few rooms myself, uh, aimed more at kind of Q&A and education. Um, you know, I, it's been cool uh, meeting more people on there and, and getting pinged into rooms when certain questions get asked, whether it's something specifically about Cinestill mm -hmm. or film developing in general. Um, I'm myself learning a lot through some of those platforms about darkroom printing because, uh, you know, not everybody has the ability to go to photography school. Yeah. Um, and there aren't, I think, enough high quality sources of really good information about some of the more uh, technical aspects of film photography, because you don't need to be the most technical person. In fact, some people absolutely shine and excel, not even knowing how their cameras work and more power to them. I'm just of the mindset that, you know, having the knowledge and having good technical skills enables you to execute that same creative vision that can oftentimes be divorced from the technical side of things to the best of your ability. There's something to be said for surprises and spontaneity, and that's awesome, but there's also something to be said for having a vision and being able to execute it exactly how you want it to with repeatable results and just keep firing away and, and, you know, making really good use of uh, the, the limited budgets that we all have. That's true. I'm definitely one of those people that I really don't understand what my camera does. Like I shoot yeah. after priority most of the time. Sometimes I'll dip into manual if I'm like shooting something that's a little dark and like the aperture priority is not doing what I want it to. I'll go yeah. manual a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just, I just bought a spot meter. <laughs> yeah. So I have a spot meter for my four by five. It's great. Mm -hmm. Like I, I had it for my medium format camera. So it's like I learned a little bit about that. Um, for sure. But, I, but that's stuff that you can apply to, to, to everything. I mean, the same fundamentals of, of exposure, uh, you know, that, that I'm thinking about when I'm using a spot meter. I take into account when I'm using a, a, a point and shoot that I know has a center weighted meter. Uh, the, the same, you know, experience that I try to have in terms of reading light helps me shoot my reloadable disposable cameras. Um, all that knowledge is power that you can apply wherever you want. And I, like your point on like the, the misinformation and disinformation, that, that's a big one because like that's one of my chief frustrations with like a lot of like the YouTube creator content that's out there is that like I'm not going to diminish their exuberance and, and excitement about like you know, all of the film photography stuff, but like, you know, there, there's some cats out there that have a, a decent following that, you know, probably shouldn't be taken as seriously as they're being taken because like you know they they don't they're, they're giving people the wrong information and so like you know people are going to get upset when it doesn't work out for them um or they end up just driving the prices up of shit because it's just like check out this cool thing i bought at value village for eight bucks <laughs> and now it's like 500 because hipsters <laughs> I mean, that I'm not, like, I can't get too mad at because, like, you know, most of this stuff is, is discontinued. Yeah. So, like, the market will do what the market will do uh, if, if it gets talked about, especially on a, on a really uh, popular platform. Guess what? People will search for it. You know, 
supply is limited, demand goes up, yada yada. Um, when it comes to the when it comes to the misinformation stuff, though, like yeah, it, it is frustrating, and you can't you can't make somebody take a video down or uh, posting a, a a correction in the comments section is only going to do so much. But you know, it, it's it's very much so you know, that kind of mentality of, of be the change that you want to see in the world. So that's why we're starting to take more, uh, more, a more serious look at video content, specifically on the education side. Um, and I think that there are some gems out there in terms of, of education based film photography, uh, Matt Marash, uh, from the, you know, uh, film photography, uh, project, uh, is, is a huge proponent of that. You know, the, the FEP has always done great things for uh, photo, film photographic education. Matt runs uh, classes in, in the community darkroom at Midwest Photo Exchange. His YouTube channel that he's really, you know, jumped back into during the pandemic uh, is very much so kind of focused on, on large format, but not exclusively, is amazing. I've learned so much from him. I see here that Stephanie, who also relatively recently has jumped into to 4x5 along with me, uh, it has been learning from him. So it's just, uh, I, I look forward to more educational content out there because like the fun lifestyle going out, shooting a camera in a location is great. I watch that stuff too, but I definitely want to see more educational uh, content on there, more, uh, you know, female film photographers uh, and, you know, minorities and people of color having a very different experience and being able to you know be representative of what the variety of film photographers look like you know representation matters it makes you feel welcome it makes you feel inspired um, and just all that stuff is awesome to see so uh, Hillary Jean Felder here says on that note do you guys think of what do you guys think of the Olympic stylus epic worth it overhyped i i have to say overhyped and like yeah i say the same thing for like the contact cameras and all those things because like all those electronic based cameras are like just fucking ticking time bombs waiting to blow up and you know all, all these like people that jumped on the hype and spent like a grand on a contacts have no idea that they just spend a grand on a grenade that like one day is just going to die on them and then it's going to be boo hoo all over the place like i i know that's going to happen with my f5 i love my f5 it's like my ride and die camera but i know it's going to die sooner than later and you know all the king's horses and all the king's men will never put it back <laughs> again um same with my f100 and things like that um so it's like I I tend to shy away from like spending big money on those things. Like the only one that I like got sucked into was the Nikon 35 Ti. <laughs> I bought one and it was the most gorgeous camera I've ever owned. It was so nice. But I fucking hated almost every photo I took with it because <laughs> I me and the autofocus on it, we just didn't get along. And, like, I just couldn't quite, like, get the handle of how that autofocus works. So I just ended up with a bunch of blurry-ass photos. Yeah. And then I was also, like, this is an $800 ticking time bomb. And, and I don't want to be sitting on it. So I yeah. – my, my perspective – and this is something that, like, on uh... – on on clubhouse that i've been very vocal about i don't want to kind of you know bag on anybody's camera or camera choice that being said for me and and you know the way that i shoot the way that i want to be shooting for years and years i'm not even necessarily thinking about it with the perspective of like handing a, a camera down to a future generation or anything like that but like i know that you know uh i want to be shooting film for as long as as possible so I want cameras that are going to last. A mechanical camera can be serviced. Even if there are, are parts that become difficult to find, you know, if it's a physical part and not a circuit board, um, it can be measured and manufactured, whether that's through 3D printing or, or you know, 
custom CNC machining. There's the the guy Graflex parts. I, I can't remember where in the US he's based, but he's just you know custom CNC machining. Uh, you know, rangefinder cams. If there's a uh, a problem with light leaks in a camera, you can replace those. You can't do the same thing for um, an, an all electronic camera. So I'm not saying don't buy them, but you know, be mindful of the fact that they may not be able to be uh, serviced as as easily, if at all. There we go. Graphlex Parts is in Minnesota. Nice. So when it comes and, and, and that has played a part in a lot of the decisions that I have made. I had a, a Leica M6, which the shutter's not controlled electronically, but there is a meter in there, which is great and, and useful, but and not that I bought it for resale value, but like, you know, you never know what's gonna happen. You know, things happen, shit happens, life happens, and you may need to sell uh assets that you have in order to to raise money. I knew that if at any point the delicate little 80s electronics in there were to die, then the value of that camera would, would drop. So I swapped it out for an M2, and I've never been happier. Um, there's a reason why I went with the RB67 over an RZ, and it's, it's just something that I do personally, and I can still use and borrow from friends and try out cameras that have a bunch of electronics in them. A lot of those things are awesome little uh, features and, yeah. and things like that. But learning and really using stuff that is very, very bare bones and mechanical means that, you know, that's my, those are my fundamentals. That's my basis is in working with something that is completely mechanical. So I've got those skills of, you know, of, of being proficient at manual focus and zone focusing and, and metering without a meter. Uh, or, or having an external meter. And so those are skills that don't go away if you have something like an F100 or an F5 in your hands. Yeah. You, you, you just, in fact, a lot of times get better. You can see what the camera is doing and what the electronics are telling you and be like, no, that's not right. Or, okay, I see where it's coming from, but I'm going to choose to give it another stop of exposure or something along those lines. Well, and to Dave's point there, like, four by five cameras seem to have the most longevity and like absolutely like that's one of the things I love most about my four by five is I can literally shoot anything I want with it like you know learn from from what I've learned from Dave I've shot Instax in it I've shot Polaroid in it like it, integral film um, not just like pack film and, and sheet film um, and if anything goes wrong with it outside of like shutter repair, which I'll sh sh shutter off to someone else, like, you know, mm -hmm. I can fix most anything that goes wrong with that one. And same with like my Mamiya C33, like that thing's a tank and, you know, a part broke on it and I had to ship it to a place in Quebec City that um, could fix it. I spent almost as much on the repair as I did on the camera, but it's going to last another like multiple decades they think that camera's from like the 60s and it just broke last year so that's a pretty good run for for a camera um yeah. or even even something like this like uh you know the the chroma cameras the intrepid cameras like yeah. the awesome thing is that those those companies are around they're they're modern obviously we don't know that they're necessarily going to be here in 100 years but you know you know that like if, if a if a part breaks i can call steve from chrome and be like hey my front standard i dropped it my front standard broke can i buy a new one and he'll laser cut a you know acrylic out of another piece and ship it to me like there's something really really great about that and there, like yeah and then like on that same vein like the dora goodman cameras as well like there's mm -hmm. cool stuff happening there but that also kind of like goes back to like a problem that um i talked when i had phil on the show which also that goes back to a qu question brandy had earlier on um when i was talking to phil he said that there will be another film padea but like when it's safe for people to like meet in person because yeah. he wants it to be an in-person thing and not really virtual because it just doesn't translate as well in into a virtual thing which i agree 100 percent. like you know the the film padea was like a great experience because you could spend time with people in person and you can break off and go into groups a lot like how Policon is. 
Um, but what, what he also talked about there is like the future of cameras and like, it's great that um, there's a resurgence in film and uh, we're able to like buy like, you know, film from Kodak and Fuji and, you know, Revlog and, you know, uh, Rolly and the Lomography and all these different uh, different places to get film from and like Kodak is committed cre like bringing back different emulsions and Fuji's doing whatever the fuck they do um, <laughs> but like the one thing that isn't new that's being created is new cameras and, and new shutters and things like that like that's where it, it gets a little worrisome because it's like we have all this new media to use but a dwindling everyday supply of cameras to consume them with. And even the Dora Goodman stuff, it's like, it's cool that it's new camera bodies, but you have to find lenses and shutters to, to use. And um, so it's like, someone needs to start making those things again. <laughs> Otherwise we're gonna be in big trouble. Yeah, it's, in, in it's, it's tricky, especially on the, on the thing about the shutters. I mean, it's doable. I mean, the take a look at the, the Lomography LCA and LCA 120 cameras. Like, those are cameras that have a, a, a built-in meter, electronic eye, whatever you want to call it, uh, and a shutter and glass lenses. So, like, well, the problem is that shutters are very doing easy to do. Like, it's the, the shutters, and this is, like, the point that Phil made, like, the curtain shutters for, like, DS, like uh, for SLRs and things like that no one other than Leica is, is making those today. And even Leica has been kind of like dwindling their production on it. So it, it's easy to do like, you know, the portable like LCA type cameras and stuff because like, you know, in, in point and shoots, like, you know, uh, Ilford's coming out with their new reusable um, that looks pretty decent. Uh, mm -hmm. The Lomography reusable is great. It's a cheap, piece of plastic but like it takes fantastic photos um but no one really knows outside of leica how to make curtain shutters anymore and so we might not see new slrs for quite some time and that's something that sort of baffles my mind a lot is just like you know it's 2021 and we have all this like you know fucking technology capability and we don't know how to build a fucking curtain shutter that dudes it's figured not, out in like the like it's not not knowing how to do it i think a lot of it is in terms of like with manufacturing like that minimum order quantities are everything so like That's what company can can place a 10,000 unit minimum order on on a curtain shutter yeah i don't know well, and I think that's also like a big, big problem of globalization is that little outfits that used to do this stuff don't exist anymore because, you know, they got all taken out by the big outfits and then it's no longer economical for them to make this product anymore because they won't make enough profit off of it. So they won't do it. And then since they stopped production of it, you know, maybe the tribal knowledge of how to like make that product um, doesn't exist anymore because the people that used to know that are no longer working or possibly dead now. And like, it's a weird thing with that kind of stuff is like they could have the directions and the instructions on how to do it, but unless you actually know how to even read them, like having those directions mean nothing. Cause it's like, you know, I could get a Gordon Ramsay recipe and it's probably going to taste like dog shit because I'm not Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> I don't know. That, that's the one thing that like kind of freaks me out about film photography is just like one day the cameras are just going to dry up and that's going to be a sad day. And then like, you know, on, I'll be like, on a private note. <laughs> on a brighter note there's a lot of chatter in the in the chat about 800 t4 by 5 i, I yeah. think that day will represent a solid maybe i don't know like 20 30 35 percent of the total demand uh like, dave is amazing like i'm gonna <laughs> get out of dave my all-time favorite photograph of me was shot by dave um it's actually my profile picture on instagram he shot it at the 2019 Policon and um, 
yeah, it's just such a beautiful like he's he's just a wicked talented man. Like you know, I appreciate Dave very much. <laughs> yeah, man, I really want to meet you. I've got nine well now eighteen days until my second vaccine. And I really want to give a lot of people some hugs. Do make a trip up to the uh the Bay Area and and hit him up. And while you're there, go see JP WTF. <laughs> he definitely needs a hug. Um someone broke into his car recently. I saw. Jacked all of his gear. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's got the plate though. I mean, hopefully that works. Yeah, I really hope so. That's uh that's a wicked bummer. And, uh, yeah, Dave, let me know when you're down here. I want to show you the, the Cinestill uh, office. Show you where the magic happens. Well, part of the magic. There, the, Dave said, when will Cinestill 4x5 ever be available? He says, will it ever be available? The answer is yes. I do not know when. Okay. I would love to see some 50D on 4x5 too. I really like 50D a lot. Any Anything that, uh, you know, comes from a master roll can be cut down into a smaller sheet. I mean, it's just, it's just a question. Because like that, that, that's one of the, the tricky things, right? Is that uh, if you are going to get some material and make it for a different format, that's taking product away from the other SKUs. That's a tricky, you know, uh, thing to figure out is, you know, at, at what point are you comfortable restricting the supply of a more profitable, more important uh, version for the thing that's going to sell less that's going to move more slowly that's obviously like and anything when you first you know launch it is gonna sell out really quick but moving down the line like that that's what production planning is for and so it's it's, it's tricky well hey brandy thank you for for stopping by i'm actually at 14 percent battery so i'm gonna ride this out for a little bit longer but i'm gonna be keeping my eye on my on my battery merlin because once i get a little bit too low i'll probably have to to sign off myself that's all good. We we can wrap it up here with with uh, your battery uh, going down there. But I appreciate your time, Andre. It was so good to chat with you. It's been way too long, and mm -hmm. uh, I can't wait for the border to open up again. Because uh, you know, right before it closed, LA was like on my list of places to go next. Because um, there's a bunch of people I want to go visit there. So um, right after I go to Denton, Texas, to hang out with Armand and get some Tex-Mex. LA. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, it was, it was great chatting with you, and I appreciate everyone hanging out with us. Um, it was so much fun. Next week, I'm going to have AJ Holmes on here, nice. um, which should be a fun chat from Negative Supply, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was off of Clubhouse. I have never met AJ before. Um, I just saw what he looked like today when he sent me an email of his photo. Um, to put on a promo post. Um, I know what his voice sounds like, though, so that was cool. Um, yeah, so looking forward to that chat next week. Awesome. Well, yeah, once again, uh, Merlin, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to chat with you here and, uh, and your, your, your audience, your listeners. <laughs> uh, look forward to, to watching this back, and uh, thank you to everybody in the chat who you know, sent in some great questions. Uh, a lot of people I, I know and recognize and a lot of people I didn't. So uh, thank you all very, very much. And Stephanie, definitely start that YouTube channel. There's going to be a lot of trolls, but there's always going to be a lot of trolls. Don't there's let that stop. Trolls. And you can always turn commenting off. You know, fuck the trolls. We just delete those comments. Yeah, exactly. So I would support you 100%, Stephanie, so you should do it. All right. All right. Here's Take guys. care. Great night. Love you all. All right. Bye.